Right, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time uh, for our second debate, which is uh, how to involve uh, citizens, the citizens that we all are, uh, who vote for you, uh, who, um, who uh, finance uh, uh, the European projects, how to involve uh, the citizens that we all are in regional and local uh, projects. Delighted to have on the stage, uh, in order to um, discuss this, we have uh, Simon Gündner, who's a professor at the University of Hamburg for Applied Sciences in Germany. We have Georgios Kaminis, the mayor of uh, Athens. Uh, we uh, have uh, Witold Stempien, uh, who uh, is replacing uh, Hanna Stanowska, who was supposed to be on the uh, panel, but she can't, unfortunately, uh, make it. Uh, Milan Vcinic, uh, who's the mayor of uh, Bratislava, with us, uh, together with uh, Daniel Termont, uh, the mayor of Ghent uh, in Belgium, and the summing up at the end of the uh, roundtable will be done by uh, Zita uh, Gomai, a Hungarian member of the European uh, Parliament. Uh, once again, we have asked uh, uh, an expert uh, to uh, make a summing up. Uh, uh, you will be doing the summing up, and uh, an expert to introduce the debate, and that's why uh, Simon Guntner from the University of Hamburg uh, is here. How can we involve citizens do citizens actually want to be involved, or do they just vote for people and say, do it yourselves, we vote, vote for you? Do we as citizens actually want to be involved? Wenn Sie das auf Deutsch oder auf Englisch machen? Are you going to do that in German or English? Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, everybody, and many... Sie machen das in sieben Minuten, natürlich. Ich mache das in sieben Minuten. Seven minutes, of course, yes. I'll do it in seven minutes. Time is running. I brought some slides. Yes, so I'd like to start with, uh, with two or three things that I think we can all here in the room take for granted. First of all is we all think participation is valuable and good, and participation should go beyond just voting for a party. That has emerged in Europe over the last years, and I think all in this room can sign up to this. The second thing is we all know that participation comes in different sizes and shapes, and it will always depend on the local tradition, the local circumstances, there is no blueprint. This is a picture of a small project here in Copenhagen, I took it yesterday, um, in which homeless people were involved in designing the public space. And you see here the project is called the Outside Living Room, a very successful project. This is an image of a very different size of a city in Germany where participation did not go so well in a major infrastructure project about a, uh, about a railway station. And you have heard it over the last years in the press, people were not happy about the way they have not been involved um, before. Nevertheless, and because of these developments, a range of instruments have emerged over the last years that we can use to participate people. Um, these, this is the toolbox of participative democracy, and I'm sure you will know many of them. Town meetings, citizen panels, participatory budgeting, planning for real, you name it. In most of our European cities, some of these have been played with and experienced in the last years. There's many hopes that we have on participative democracy, but there's also some traps. We know that it's very difficult to implement this. The hopes that we have, we do all these things, we try to go beyond traditional representation, we try to involve citizens in planning because we think we will have better policies and projects, because we can broaden the ownership, because when they're involved they will buy it and they will, they will use it, and we can enhance the, the legitimation of the decisions that we're taking. However, there's a couple of traps. The biggest trap that I'd like to refer to is what I call the efficiency trap. We have a clear time frame, we have a clear budget, and I can ensure you half of the people who are interested in it will drop out in the process because they would need more time to elaborate and discuss. A second one is usually we have an underrepresentation of minority interests because they don't have the power to come forward in uh, the search for consensus. And the, the next point on consensus, very often we arrive at the lowest common denominator. That is unfortunately uh, a trap which we can run into when we try to participate and do such projects. Now, there are some factors that 
lead to success or failure of these. And to be very bold, we can refer to them as the macro-politics and the micro-politics. On the broader framework level, the issue is, the big issue is about decisions and non-decisions. What is up for the people to decide and which decisions do you or do we as institutions have taken before? Are we actually honest and frank to the people? Do they know what they can decide about? That is a very, very important issue. A second important issue is which mandate do we give to a local forum, for instance? And are we actually um, there to take a risk? Will we accept if the decision people take is different to what we expect in the beginning? If we look at the micro-politics, if we look at the design of forums, of citizens' panels, etc., there's a few clear factors that we have to consider. How do we arrange access? How do we outreach to the community? Do we make a meeting in the morning, in the afternoon, or in the evening? That will decide if parents attend a meeting. That is a very basic, very crucial thing. Do we, when we look at the logistics, how long does such an exercise take? What do we think, how much, how much time can residents actually spend in these meetings? All those sorts of issues are actually political decisions because with those we determine who is in and who is out. Related to, the, to this, the style of communication and language. Do we communicate in a language that people can understand? And if we have an agenda for a meeting with residents, do we have the, the point that they can raise their voice at the beginning of the agenda, on top, or do we have it on bottom of the agenda? That is all political issues that will decide about the success of such an exercise. So if we, if we look at these factors, there's a few issues coming from them, which I would like to spend the last one and a half minutes on. Um, and I hope that they can stimulate the debate um, amongst the politicians up here. Be realistic about what you can actually open for public debate and what you don't open for, for public debate and don't fool the people. Tell them what is at stake and what not. Second, very big thing, if we look at the evaluations, for instance, of urban development programs in the, in the UK over the last 10 years, a big failure was that we thought the local community is one single entity. It is not. It is as heterogeneous and controversial as the world. Very complex. Don't address the co local community as if there was something like one interest. Third point, constantly refine your methods. Where now people in this room are tweeting, twittering, etc. Bring these things into your exercises, but understand that not everybody will have access to them. I don't have access to Twitter, for instance, but I would be happy to know what people are, um, are talking about. Next one, another crucial thing, in particular when we talk about the next ERDF um, um, period. Have clear links between the participative exercises and the arenas of representative democracies. Don't build parallel regimes for the citizens and take the real decisions somewhere else. Make transparent how these two spaces, the mainstream policy making and the projects, are linked um, together. Last, very important point, emphasize the democratic value of the exercise and not the instrumental value. Don't emphasize that you want to achieve a certain project for, 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 for best money, um, etc., but emphasize that you want to talk to people in a serious dialogue. And that means respond to them after the exercise and take your time. Thank you. You did exactly seven minutes. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Perfect. Um, Milan uh, Vtachnik, uh, as I said, you're the mayor of uh, Bratislava. I think you have um, uh, some interesting examples to give us uh, of the concept of uh, open uh, municipality. Uh, being open, informing uh, your uh, citizens. Could you uh, give us uh, those examples, please? I, I, I will... Sorry. S speak it's working. The, the okay. Uh, I will follow the introduction, which was very, very good, and I, I, I think I very much appreciate that. And I will tell you a short, brief situation in Bratislava today. In 1989, 23 years ago, we, have, we were... Have full squares, full of people who were believing that the communist regime will change into something very positive. They will be participating, they will be changing. After 20 years, they are disappointed. 
they are apathetic and they lost the confidence in the politicians because they see the politicians need them only once in a four years time. They are caring for themselves, not, not caring on, of the interests of the people. And we have corruption scandals which lead to another full squares in 2012, in these days. Before early elections, we had full, full squares after 20 years of apathy. The young people were coming and saying, we need a new system. We are not satisfied with what's going on. And we need an answer. And I think the answer was mentioned here. The, this means for me the illness of, of representative democracy. We need to include the participatory democracy into decision-making process, which is much more difficult on national level. So we can start on the, on the level of the cities and regions. It's much easier. We are closer to the people. So we have to deal with them. We have to find measures how to, uh, how to include them, involve them into decision-making process. And there were mentioned, there were mentioned uh, concrete measures how, how to do it. And we are trying to do this also in the frame of uh, Bratislava. The, the first is to inform the people, to provide them the information. I would like to stress this because the tendency of the municipalities, the politicians, is to hide information, not to tell people important things because if they should participate on decision-making process, they should know what's going on, what the decisions are, what the facts are. So you need to be open in, in providing the information. You need to be transparent, not to lose the confidence of the people, because if they vote for you, they have the confidence, they have the trust. If you keep the confidence, then you can involve them in, in the decision-making process. We are trying to organize the public debates, public hearings, which is one part of, of this participatory process to provide for people the possibility to tell their opinion. And what we used is the structured questioning. Structure the questions you want to hear from the people, because you, if you only ask them general questions, general issue, you will get different answers. If you structure the questions you ask the people, then you can get the answers which you can count with. Majority for this, minority for that, so this is, this is the approach we tried. And then we finally, in serious issues, we make the polls, official polls by the professional agency. And then we got the, the answers which are representative. C can you give us some concrete examples? It sounds quite interesting what you did, but give us concrete examples yeah, this, of what This you was did. the example of the building which, which uh, was supposed to be demolished in the city. And the people were protesting to save it. They made a petition. And very many people signed the petition, but the previous mayor was not, not in favor of, of saving the building. So after we, after the, we entered in, into this new election term, we asked the people, we, do you really want, the majority of the people, do you really want to save the building? Because it needs money, we need to, to cope with the investor, with the developer, which was interfering into the, into the issue. And the 64, 46% uh, almost majority of, of Bratislava citizens voted in the poll for saving the, the building. In, at the beginning, there were 200 brave people who were fighting against the demolition. At the end, it was almost majority. So we decided in the city council to save the building. And I would like to another, mention another example which we have experience with. It's the participatory budgeting. It comes from Latin, Latin America but we, we are trying to, to introduce it in Bratislava. The first experience is maybe very small. We have only another 200, different 200 people getting part of the participatory budgeting, which means they were allowed to decide on certain amount of money, very small, it was a pilot project. We thought we would, we would come to 1% of the budget of the city to be decided by the people themselves where to put the money. How, how, does, how does that work? Do you have an assembly of the people or do, how, which people are they and how, does, how, how do you actually organize that? The system is open. You can, you can enter the system by the, by the software so you can apply to be a part of the community. We have only five communities from these 200 people. I hope there will be more people, more communities in the second year of the, of the project. So in first year it was only five communities. They discussed by themselves on the community forum what the projects will they propose for the decision. Then the community representatives met 
and there was a deliberation forum on which they decided which project will be number one, which number two, number three, and this number f first up to f fifth they submitted to the, to the city council. And we say we will respect your decision and we will implement these projects in the next year. So this is what we are now doing and going through the next year of, of exercise, believing there will be more people because this apathy is not easy to overcome. People don't believe us that we seriously count with their voice, with their opinion. They, they think somehow that this may be only a theater. You know, it's only an exercise, it's only a game. But we would like to convince them we really seriously want to hear their opinion, to involve them in the decision-making process and really do something according to their voice. Not all the voices you can, you can respect, because the question is who, which voice will you respect? You can't respect everybody. You can't respect every voice, every opinion. But you are trying to get the majority. You are trying to get the, the best ideas. You are trying to get active citizens. The participatory budgeting leads in cities where they are much further than we are to 10% of the active people. We in Bratislava have 400,000 citizens. If we have 200 active at the beginning and come to 40,000, 10% of the citizens to be active, this will be a very good result. So this is where we are going. Okay, thank you for that uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, example. Um, let's uh, go to uh, Ghent now. Uh, Daniel Termont, you're the mayor of uh, Ghent in uh, Belgium. Which language uh, would you like to speak? Well, uh, I'm going to take the enormous luxury that I can speak in my own language. Which so is... it's much easier for me. I'm going to speak in Dutch. So take your headsets, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. There are only a few who understand what I'm going to say otherwise. So, take your headset. Okay, uh, well, what they asked me to give you some uh, concrete... Uh, no, I'm going to speak Nederlands. No, I'm going to speak Dutch, of course. I've been asked to give you some practical examples of how uh, we deal with involvement, citizen involvement in Ghent. Let me start by saying that we want to involve our citizens. And what we uh, think is that you've got to uh, keep some control yourself. Uh, you need to communicate. You need to determine what your goals are. You need to tell people what they can and can't do. And you need to know what kind of creative concepts you're going to be using. In other words, you need to spend time on it. Uh, you've got to have people and you've got to have money. To start with, I'd like to talk about how we organize this uh, in Ghent and then give you some practical examples. We have, from the organization, we have a specific service, that's a city renovation and uh, neighborhood action. There's three components. The first is uh, what we call the uh, neighborhood uh, activities. We divided Ghent into 25 different areas. Uh, again, for organization and citizen involvement, and all actions are uh, done dealt with through that. And in every neighborhood, we have a full-time neighborhood organizer. That's what we call them. And they work as a sort of link between uh, the citizens and uh, city governance. Uh, um, they pass on signals, and of course, they have to organize citizen involvement locally. Then we have a neighborhood program, which we evaluate regularly. It's drawn up on the basis of daily input from our citizens. And very regularly, we organize neighborhood debates, but I'll be talking about that in a minute. Secondly, we have the city renovation um, service we, where we have uh, program organizers. They're people who have a kind of bird's eye view over the um, areas which include more than one neighborhood. Uh, because if we don't have that, you might lose the links between the neighborhoods. You know, if you're in one neighborhood, you're going off in one direction and the next door neighborhood is going in another direction. Uh, so in Ghent, we also have a um, local work and uh, neighborhood work uh, uh, service, which involves uh, participation of all uh, citizens and, of course, social cohesion among them. Uh, we are trying to keep things the way they were in the 19th century. Uh, that was at that time we had people from all sorts of different backgrounds uh, living together in Ghent and that required a lot of uh, effort to keep them living together uh, peacefully. Um, now let me give you some good examples. We organize with all of the city council 
Uh, we organise at least twice a legislative term, uh, a neighbourhood debate uh, that's uh, very popular with our citizens. We go straight to them, talk to them, not in a plenary sort of setup like here. We go for a um, talking shop, a, 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 like a bar where you sit around a table with the people, you look at them in the eye. We spend a lot of money so that people in their neighborhood can organize all the activities they need to promote society. There could be receptions, barbecues, uh, all sorts of things. Could be a website, a website for the neighborhood, things like that. They decide for themselves. And uh, for example, we had a group of people who are keeping facilities open that we had closed. They're keeping them open during the weekend, although we shut them down during the weekend on a voluntary basis. Uh, now, uh, we've done something like what you've done in Bratislava. We said to the people in their 25 um, neighborhoods, you know, do, do pick the project you like, and I can guarantee you, as mayor, that we will do the most popular projects you suggest. So we got four projects, from each from the 25 neighborhoods, the 100-point plan. You know, it could be all sorts of things. It could be a new um, cycle track. Uh, it could be a roundabout. It could be a uh, exercise area for dogs, uh, all sorts of things. And we've put that into our regular budget. And um, uh, that, so our citizens have their say over quite a lot of the budget. We have a whole lot of other initiatives, but my time is up, I see. Um, we have an initiative where people say, we're going to clean up our streets and our neighborhood, and we don't just give them equipment. For that, uh, we give them all sorts of uh, extra money for new social and cultural activity in uh, their neighborhood. And to conclude, um, something I, an idea I took over from my uh, opposite number in Rotterdam, uh, we give them a number of hours of police work that they can decide on what the police will do during those hours. You know, some might think we want to stop people driving too quickly. Others say we've got people fly tipping all over the place. Um, so. We're developing uh, techniques now that allow the citizens, people living in the neighborhood, who determine what they want the police to make a priority for their action. And that's uh, very successful. I'll leave it there, but I just did want to say this. Uh, in Cannes, in Mipim, and there was the majors debate, and there was uh, a young lady who has to present herself, and she says, I'm the mayor of uh, Copenhagen, and everybody looks because we know Frank, uh, Frank Jensen, of course, and says, yeah, 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 but, 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 but one of the mayors of Copenhagen, because in Copenhagen there are six mayors and one Lord Mayor, but in Ghent they are all a little bit mayor. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for that example of uh, participation and uh, taking on of uh, responsibility. Let's go to um, Athens now, uh, Georgios uh, Kaminis. Um, I think you're going to tell us about the, the role of Urbakt, uh, which uh, fosters good practices uh, in, uh, in towns. Um, and also, we've obviously seen the, the pictures of the, the, the problems in your town uh, over the last uh, year. There's another point which I was quite interested, I think you want to make, is that people usually come together against things. It's very hard to mobilize people for projects. Um, people usually uh, are very willing to mobilize, as you said yourself, against uh, an airport or something. But it's very difficult to mobilize people for things. Which language are you speaking? Well, I will speak in Greek. Perfect. Okay. Just have to go and get a headset. So thank you for inviting me, but I prefer speaking in Greek so that I can be better understood. <clears throat> so, uh, giving a, a precise example, Malon, dinodas ena συγκεκριμένο παράδειγμα. I'd like to start with a practical example. It is, in fact, difficult, generally speaking. to actually get people to express their opinions if there's no structured dialogue. It's usually, as you said, people who are protesting against something who express their views. So people need to be organized in, in such a way you know, to create the right conditions so that those people who are in favor of something, who champion a cause, uh, can speak as well. It's obviously easier to protest against something rather than to actually muster support for something. So, for example, we could take... Uh, uh, the whole question of a, of a c c c parking the car and uh, um, car parks. The municipal 
council in one area of Athens had uh, Want, had wanted to build an underground car park and then uh, there was the opposition uh, expressed its views but then there were bulldozers that uh, t toppled the trees in on the square and the the building started or let's say that the hole was uh, was dark and and then there was a lot of uh, protest quite sort of violent protest against that and this that this area was then uh, abandoned by the uh, citizens, uh, but there was a lot of resistance, a lot of opposition. There was there was a lot of um, protests from the opposition in the municipal council as well. There was lots of opposition uh, events that were organised, and and so there was such a such strong opposition that this meant that throughout the entire region, uh, underground car parks became a taboo. Uh, it was said that, for example, if you uh, wanted to build a, a, an underground uh, uh, an, an underground car park, then then other other projects would not be possible. And and, and but but in in high, in in, in uh, very dense conurbations, you need underground car parks. We try to tackle it differently, however. So, of course, we needed, first of all, to have very thorough discussions in the context of, of our municipal council to start off with. There were various people who were on the uh, municipal council who were against uh, the original plan for an underground car park. But then we organized a workshop, or we got everyone involved, we got all those who were interested to come along. And then thirdly, we 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 try, we try to to bring together public opinion. We try to get a critical mass of, of public opinion. In fact, a majority of the people were in favour of this car park. So so now we're we're trying to get confirmation uh, from the ministry that we can. So that so we want to get more support now, broader support uh, for this underground car park. So I think we were able to convince a majority of the public that this underground car park was necessary. And uh, and now to get on to a more difficult topic, that is um, uh, cens censuses, I mean, uh, we, we, were, we were asked to organize a census and to, to see, or a referendum to see what the situation was. But I think that, sorry, when it comes to organizing reference referendums, well, you really have to be, you have to be able to uh, you have to be able to organize these well uh, you, 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 so that everyone can express their views I mean other, otherwise there are other parameters which have an an, in, an influence on political uh, referendums like political uh, belonging to a political group political uh, there is a tendency there's a to make things more too complicated when it comes to organizing a referendum people don't really know what's going on people aren't able to express their views and so uh, so I, I think that but the citizen participation is really important if you want to uh, create something rather than just stopping something or preventing something. If you want to create something, you have to talk to everyone, you have to talk to the grassroots, you have to get through to people and you have to get people involved, you have to make sure that they're abreast of the situation, you have to make people really reflect and then see that they've got difficult decisions to take and then bring them to a situation where they can take a decision. Uh, I think you have to create a framework. Um, I'm obviously, organizing a protest is, is fairly easy. Organizing a demonstration, organizing a protest in a, is easy in times of crisis. Let's uh, now turn to uh, Vitold uh, Stempien uh, from uh, Lodge. Perhaps you can give us a few examples of the way that uh, you involve uh, citizens in the decisions that are made in, uh, in your town. Uh, well, when it comes to uh, Polish uh, uh, um, matters, well, there's a well, there's a there's a very specific uh, there's a, there's a very specific situation there. Things get things get pretty heated um, when when I'm I'm replacing uh, Svanovska today. The president of the capital of our region. I come from the area of Lodz, 
uh, which is a region with two and a half million inhabitants. So uh, I can refer also to uh, grassroots activities and citizens' uh, movements when they address the institutions. And I can see this from the regional perspective. So in our region, we've got two and a half million inhabitants. We've got more than 20 provinces. And it's uh, difficult to try to involve uh, civil society in discussions, especially when it comes to using EU funds. But partnership and social consultation, this is an essential element when it comes to the approval of uh, projects which do uh, take up and absorb EU funds. We have uh, divided the regions into four sub-regions uh, with this end in mind. The, there's Lodz, which is the capital of the region, and then the, the, the neighboring provinces. Uh, more than one million people are living in the conglomerate, in, uh, in the in conurbation. And then north, east, and west, those are the other three regions or sub-regions. Uh, we, we divided the region up in this way because the region of Lodz, or Wodz, uh, which was created 20 years ago, brings together different zones with uh, different levels of uh, social development with different traditions. So the, the past uh, comes back to uh, haunt us when uh, Poland was divided between Austria, uh, Russia, and uh, now in a way uh, there's some, some, some traditions have, have, have remained with us, some sort of things, there have been some knock-on effects from that, uh, culturally speaking. We try to involve local authorities, we try to involve uh, uh, civil society and uh, various uh, proposals, there have been various proposals for activities and projects that have been discussed. We, we've, we have uh, tried to re resolve local territorial issues by having dis discussions. These are projects which involve uh, local authorities, and these, uh, these allow for multi-level multi governance, uh, involvement of different levels of, of government. So there are projects uh, uh, which are when it when it comes to the detail of the projects, we've already we've already collected in advance the opinions of citizens. So this this system seems to work. This process of, of public consultation seems to work. And this project, which came out of this process of consultation and involvement of local authorities and NGOs, well, I think, I think for example, that this is the the path. Uh, that uh, uh, should be followed when it comes to projects related to tourism, when it comes to projects relating to leisure, when it comes to path, paths that, uh, that, that bring together uh, three provinces and 200 different local authorities. These are paths for walkers, for tourists, and uh, and the, this, this uh, tourist path allows us to uh, draw attention to the traditions of our region. So this, this proceed this uh, project was was born because of the because of because of the vis visit to these different uh, local author local authorities and we've we've worked out what the local role should be and, and then the idea is to enhance growth to promote growth we have a, a pin we, we we've pinpointed and um, we've pin we put that we put little uh, flags on the a map of Poland sh sh showing, showing uh, how we can build these local programs um, which, which take into account uh, uh, local needs and local traditions and build on them. So consultation and uh, dialogue with society, uh, this is part of uh, the whole information process. We've created a network of information points so that people can understand what the possibilities are for in order to apply for EU funding. We've tried to inform how applications should be filled out, how the forms should be prepared. We've tried to inform and train local authorities, but also citizens and companies so that they can try their chance. So these, in these info points, uh, we, we make it clear what uh, what uh, partners could be used for projects, projects uh, so that we, then, and then we get we get um, companies along who've been involved in projects before. We try to get the ball rolling, get the discussion going. So we've got it. We've, we've now got this strategic map of um, um, 
and we've also we've and the statistical data confirm the not the positive effect the positive consequences of uh, this approach we can collate data at our level we can uh, uh, collate this information and then and and we can we can pass on this information to the lower levels they 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 don't have the means to collate this information at themselves we can pass it down to them but they are in touch with the uh, civil society groups with whom they can discuss uh, local and provincial development projects so to wind up two specific examples of uh, what we are committed to doing We, we, we actually work on Facebook as well. This is a tool that we're using as a region. We have a project to bring together various uh, uh, local authorities, and uh, and we've uh, put this on on face on our Facebook page, and so people can express their views. Inhabitants can express their views about the local projects on this Facebook page. And these opinions are taken into account, and we can uh, draw conclusions from these opinions. And when it comes to uh, transport uh, projects, uh, um, uh, we, we, we've been able to take into account people's requests when it comes to uh, where we put uh, bus stops, where we put um, um, where the bus stop should be for a, for a bus line. So we, we've. We, we have contacts with NGOs. We, we meet them on a regular basis every two months. We try to um, stimulate the social life, the local local social life. We consult uh, companies. And the result of these discussions with NGOs and with companies is very important because it allows us to understand what the expectations of society are and then we can uh, hand them on to the European level. Just come down to the audience, but I'd like to put one uh, question to you. I'd like to turn the uh, whole debate uh, on its head. And we're all speaking as if citizens' participation is a wonderful thing. Um, is it? Do citizens need to be involved in decisions? What are the dangers of involving citizens in, in, in uh, uh, decisions that, uh, that uh, representatives make? And what do you say to the citizens? I've heard them. I've, I've, I've done quite a lot of conferences about urban issues which say, we pay for you to make these decisions. We elect you to make these decisions. Why should we be involved in making the decisions? Is citizens' participation necessarily a good thing? Hey, Gunther. Uh, Sprechen Sie? Yeah? Um, well, I just like to mention one failed example that uh, that uh, I've just visited uh, some some month ago. That was in a small uh, town in in Germany, and the urban regeneration programs that we talk about often come with clear time frames. So there are a few years and then something else is coming. At the beginning of one, they had a huge consultation exercise like you mentioned. The mayor came to this neighborhood and he walked four times through the neighborhood with the citizens. It was a huge success in the media, many pictures and all these things. And they came up with a list of 200 wishes they had afterwards. A huge list and that list was public, etc. But then nothing happened for one and a half years because the administration didn't know what to do with him. And the people were really angry at him. And when he started to, to, to invite them for working groups that would work on these things, nobody turned off. So that is, uh, the, the people would like to, I think peop, everybody's happy to, you know, to, to contribute and, 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 and to participate, but only if he's taken or she's taken seriously. And that has not often been the case in the past. Well, I'll see. Well, perhaps if I can be a bit provocative. Last week I heard a professor who said that we should be looking for new forms of democracy and participation. And perhaps we should just get rid of uh, councils because uh, very often you just have um, uh, experts, so-called experts in uh, town councils, and we should get rid of them. And, and uh, 
have much more direct democracy, but just to be provocative. Well, let me just emphasize a point, namely the uh, role of uh, authorities. I think that um, when citizens elect their representatives, they do so so that they will take decisions and in that respect they've given them a mandate and uh, they see them as experts. Now, of course, one can uh, discuss uh, whether or not uh, these representatives are necessary or not, but uh, we're there to, to do something after all. Now, of course, you can ask the question as to someone can have a high uh, quality of life uh, if they're not being accepted. 90% of the people expect somebody will de decide that. And we must have a body which decides. That was mentioned also in the in introduction. But 10% of the people are active and they want to be heard. They want to be involved. They want to contribute. So this is probably the both opinions are valid. Thank you. I'm a member of the Committee of Regions. I'm Vice, Vice uh, Mayor of a small town in Malta, I believe that we should have, uh, should encourage participation from everyone, from men and women. We need to involve everyone in the projects that we're intending to do. We have to um, include everyone's opinion, even young people's opinion and children's opinion. Children are tomorrow's future. I would also like to say that we should also listen, to, we should also give people who have disabilities a voice and we should also listen to elderly. Therefore, everyone will be able to give an opinion to better our towns and villages. We mentioned dialogue, dialogue with our citizens. We should go to our citizens ourselves. Not everyone can participate in the meetings that are held by the councils. Therefore, we should go ourselves to the citizens. This will lead to a better environment in our towns and villages. Thank you. Children, uh, is that a good idea, uh, Dr. Gunther? Oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. And we're way to where we need certainly to be much better on when we look at the Convention of Children's Rights and all these things, what we do about it, not, not enough. But I would like to take uh, the, your point to respond to the provocative statement uh, from the Mayor of Ghent, uh, which I would like to oppose. Um, and I'm a bit old-fashioned, but parties, political parties, have been there for many reasons, but one reason, or are there for many reasons, but one reason is that parties manage to organize a collective interest. And the interest is, formula is, is, is down to certain worldviews, to certain opinions and to a certain state in economic affairs. Workers' parties, uh, um, um, uh, Christian parties, it's worldviews, it's, it's certain, certain positions. I think we need a revitalization of parties because all committees and forums that are open they are important, they're, 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 they're important additions, but they always have the tendency to misrepresent certain interests. The, the, deve the development of an, argue with, of an argument within a party is a very, very important, um, 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 important aspect to formulate an interest that can then be discussed against another um, argument. And when, um, what, what the lady was just saying, women, disabilities, elderly, minorities, you name it. Look at local committees and look which interests, which interests are usually underrepresented. And I'm certainly in favor of participative um, elements, but in addition to 
represents democ uh, representative democracy. However, a big failure we have done over the last years is that we have not been quick enough in revitalizing, reforming our party culture. I think that's an important element we also have to bring into the debate. Okay, uh, yes, uh, Madam Zobai. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be, I feel like a cream on the chocolate cake, just to be one woman among so many men speakers. Uh, but of course, uh, what is uh, very, very important for me, and then I just would like to make a quick reaction. We are sitting on a time bomb. Let's make it clear. If you, if you just realize what happened during the Arab Spring, I think that we should learn. If you are not quick enough, then, then we will lose. And of course, concerning uh, the collective uh, interest and parties, shall, shall we be fair? Are we the parties of collective interest or are we the parties of elite? And that is a real question, I would say. And of course, uh, the reason why there is a real apathy all around Europe, meanwhile while we have a, a financial, economic, and I would say moral crisis, because uh, we lost uh, the confidence of ordinary citizens. And of course, that's why I'm very pleased to, to learn so many uh, good examples. So we really have to go back to the roots. We really have to go to talk to ordinary people. If it's 10 percent, then it's 10 percent. If it's 15, it's 15. But of course, you have to take into consideration every of the participants, I would say. And of course, I'm really delighted to be here, not only because Mercedes Presso is a great friend of mine and we were fighting together for, for equality for long years but uh, because, because I strongly believe in participatory democracy. And, and actually, I have to tell you, we are very close. April 1st is coming, and we should start to use the new tool, uh, the European Citizens Initiative. And the problem is that this is not the best time when we start to use this new tool, because who cares about this new tool of the, the, of the, of the participatory democracy right now? So the only way that we have everybody on the board, if you go home and just to ask, okay, what are the debates now? Do do we have local debate? Do we have regional debate? Do we have at all European debate? Meanwhile, a lot of decisions are made in Brussels, as I, as I would say, but I don't want to go further on because I would like to listen to uh, some other questions as well. Right, okay, we have a question here from another lady. I want to tell you about what, what we experienced in our small village in the Basque country. This involved participation, and it's rather different to the examples we've heard about. A few months ago, we had a task of uh, adapting the 2020 strategy to our small village, village needs. And right from the beginning, we, we had it clear in our minds that the result would, would, ha would have to be very closely related to the path that we wanted to follow. So this adjustment of the EU 2020 strategy to our village had to be done in a participative manner. And so when we talk about participation, we want this participation to involve young people in particular and even children, as has been said. So we adopted uh, various uh, methods so that we could do this. So we adapted it. And so I can say that we have a strategy uh, we, which involved uh, uh, the participation of more than 5,000 people and more than 750 different organizations. So in the Basque country, we have a population of just slightly more than 2 million. So I think this was a, a intense uh, uh, and broad participation. And we, did, and we did this throughout the procedure, right from the beginning, when we carried out a diagnosis, right to the end of the adoption of the document. And it wasn't just this one final point. In fact, if we we want to, if we want to believe in participation then the citizen has to see their needs reflected in this process they have to see that they've had an impact that they've had an influence and so we've got a document uh, which fully uh, justifies uh, uh, this all, all, the, all the contributions so and so this strategy worked and it really was a success everyone's participation was there to see thank you very much i'll take one more uh, example um, where, uh, tell us who you are Dobrý deň, prajem, som Jan Ravec, primátor uh, jedného malého mestečka z Južného Slovenska. Uh, I'm of a small town in the south of Slovakia. Now, when it comes to the participation of citizens, I think it all starts with voter turnout. You can see how interested citizens are right then. And then, of course, citizens can see whether or not what they voted for actually gets implemented. And I think it's quite understandable. It's human nature, really. 
that people don't protest when things are going well. Nobody writes or signs petitions when uh, they're happy, when things are going well. And it's true that people only really start to make their voices heard when things are not going well. And so I think that if uh, decisions are taken which citizens don't really agree with, then they do um, make their voices heard in a quite a resolute way and vice versa. Right, um, before I give the uh, uh, word for the conclusion to uh, Zita Gumai, um, any other concrete examples of, uh, perhaps from uh, Athens, of things that have changed because of citizen participation? I think it would be good to have an actual concrete, uh, a few concrete examples of things which have changed in your city because people have got together and said, we want this, um, we're, we're, we want to participate in the uh, decision-making of our town, and things have changed. Mr. Mayor. Well, I am the one who gave it the very concrete examples, but now I would like to comment on what was said. So may I proceed? Okay, thank you. So the example that Professor gave about the English town is very interesting because there, there was a consultation procedure that ended up with 2,000 demands. So it is one thing to say that we want to build a garage, let's say, and there, there is a simple yes or no, and the arguments in favor or against are more or less simple. But when you go to a city and you plan an urban regeneration, that's a complicated thing to do. It has many aspects that must be discussed, and uh, you must mediate between different groups. So it's not only a question of democratic procedures as such as we know them. It's more a question of mediation between conflicting interests among various groups. So I would like a comment on that. Thank you. From whom? Oh, you, yeah, you would like to comment yourself. Um, let's uh, have one final uh, uh, point of view from the, the room. Could you tell us who you are? Ε, επιτρέψτε μου μια πολύ μικρή παρατήρηση. Η συμμετοχική δημοκρατία δεν έχει να κάνει μόνο... Thank you. Uh, participatory democracy is not just about for uh, making decisions, but it, means, uh, but it should be about implementing them too. To show that we take an interest in people and we want to implement the things they want us to implement. I'm from Greece and as you all know at the moment we have a terrible economic and social crisis in Greece. In our economic programs we are trying to mobilize people so that they will um, help out on a voluntary basis. They will help to maintain the structures and enable the structures to act in favor of those who need it. Yeah. Well, perhaps I can just say two things very briefly. One, I think there's a major difference in culture, even in Europe, when it comes to democracy. If you look at Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, then there's a different approach to participative democracy. Now, I hear that from the questions that were put and the examples that have been given. All I can say is that in uh, our city, um, when we develop a new project, we don't just uh, produce plans and proposals. Uh, that's what we used to do. We uh, used to have plans and give them to the citizens. Uh, actually, we don't do that. We have a consultation first. Uh, we go with a blank piece of paper to people and say to them, OK, take a pencil and draw yourself what you would like to see in terms of development. And then we will use that in our discussions. That's how far we've got with the participative democracy. And now another little point, what the lady said from Malta quite right. I think everybody needs to be involved. But let me say, we have developed a specific policy and we call that uh, the people who are difficult to reach, the difficult to reach target groups. Uh, and uh, what I mean by that are the many migrants who come to our uh, city who don't know um, our language and don't know um, our customs, and it's very difficult to reach those people. And there are many people who perhaps are illiterate or they uh, are living in poverty or difficult social circumstances, and it's not really their major priority to uh, 
actually participate in democracy. They're really busy trying to survive. And if you want to get those people involved, then you need to know what their point of view is on projects. Right, Zita Gomai, uh, you've been listening to all these points of view uh, from the panel and uh, from the audience as well. I know to what extent uh, I've seen you in the European Parliament, you are uh, uh, committed to a citizen uh, uh, being involved in decision making. Um, what are the limits, uh, what are the advantages, the disadvantages, and what um, would you say to conclude uh, mm -hmm. roundtable? Sure. I would believe, first of all, that we just started. So it's, not, uh, it's almost impossible to make a conclusion. But of course, as a Hungarian, if you allow me, I just would like to greet my Hungarian colleagues here from all around uh, Hungary, I would say. And I understand that there is going to be an exhibition of Uska, but I have to mention that the mayor of Balatonfüred is here. And if you are wondering to go to an Anna Bowl, then of course, uh, he's more than pleased to explain you. So of course, we talked about a lot of things, but uh, I didn't hear the word solidarity. And then I think when we talk about participatory democracy, then I believe that we need to, to deal uh, with this word uh, solidarity. Of course, uh, now we are having the, the Danish presidency, and of course I'm very uh, pleased to sit in the panel with, with the Belgian and, and Polish colleagues, because we worked very hard for the last, uh, last uh, uh, half years. And of course, I also believe that when you deal with participatory democracy, it is also very important on European level that we started to work in Troikas, because I think it's very important to make plans, and uh, not for six months, but to make plans for for, uh, for, uh, for 18 months uh, as well. I agree with all of you that we need new forms of democracy, but at the same time, as uh, Professor said, that uh, we have to stay old-fashioned. And, and uh, I was very pleased to hear our colleague from, from the Basque Country, let's see what happened in, in Spain at the last election. You cannot win the election on Twitter and Facebook. You still need to go and talk to ordinary people because this is a tool uh, for, for taking uh, their opinion into, into consideration. Uh, I was very uh, excited to hear about the hopes and traps, and of course we need better policies, but how can you make better policies without listening uh, for ordinary citizens? So that's why I believe, and I was very happy to hear the public hearing, because that is a tool not only on local, national, uh, but on, on European level as uh, well. And of course what is also very important to have a short, medium and long-term planning as well. And you need to explain why you are doing uh, that planning as well. And of course, uh, uh, we didn't talk about the so-called generational dialogue. And if you see what's going on in European level, 22.4% of the youth are unemployed. And of course, the reason why we have to take into consideration these young people, if they don't have a hope for the future, then, then, then the, what, what's next? So that's why we prepared a strategy for that as a European uh, Socialist Party. And I just would like to remind ourselves that uh, the Commission just uh, prepared a pension reform. And of course, it is also very important to, get, to take into consideration that we live much, much longer, and of course that is also uh, quite uh, uh, important. And of course, uh, as I told you, that being the rapporteur of the co-rapporteur, just to be fair, because Ale Lamassur was my partner uh, from the Constitutional Committee, of course we were actively involved, and of course the way how we prepare this report, uh, every member of European Parliament should prepare a report like that. So it's not enough just to sit in a room and, uh, and, and have a chat with, with your assistant. It is very important to go and talk. And of course, civil society has a key role in, in, in all this uh, debate, I would say. And of course, we know that there is a growing gap uh, among uh, our citizens. And of course, that's why we should do uh, a little bit uh, better, I, I would say. And of course, by introducing the European Citizens Initiative, we have made a substantial progress in fostering participatory democracy at the EU level, but of course the question whether the citizens know about it. And, uh, and I'm very pleased that, uh, that the mayor of Bratislava is here as well, because he gave us a, a very, very good example that if people feel that they are part of the decision, they feel it's their, their decision uh, in a way uh, as well. And of course by citizens' involvement in, in pan-European projects, initiative and debates, by no means abstract their activity 
the involvement at local and, and of course at the regional level. On the contrary, I believe uh, that increasing people's awareness encourages their active involvement at all levels, and that is very important to pay attention on different levels. The local community is a very good place to start, uh, and this is the contributing to the direct improvement of our own living and, of course, working environment. In addition, I believe uh, that urban policy is a key issue for the future of uh, our societies as uh, we are confronted to major challenges in terms of mobility, and this is one word that I would like to mention, sustainable development, urbanism, and social and geographic inclusion. I believe that these are the words that we should take into consideration. And of course, uh, this is why ideas and initiatives discussed today are essential and welcome endeavors. I could mention just uh, some example as uh, as uh, Milan mentioned, the participatory budgeting within citizens' urban development projects. But I would go further. What about gender budgeting? Right? Because it, it would be also very important just to, just to go deeper. Of course, official city web pages serving as an online discussion forum, but we have to be realistic. In small villages, you cannot get the access for internet, so we have to keep these people uh, alive and give their information as well. Making and implementing decisions, I agree, uh, I agree with, with our Greek colleague, it is also crucial. And and of course, uh, as uh, Horgos just mentioned, the city debates, funding and supporting regional and local citizens' initiative and projects. I think it is, it is very, very crucial. And of course, the question is whether we are doing for or against. And of course, what, what we witnessed, how, how well organized citizens could be if there is a reason that they should be uh, together. And of course, I would like to underline a point here in every European cities we are confronted the neglected and less favored urban areas where the challenges are even higher with regards to social inclusion and restoring this link between citizens and their local institution. So this should be a priority at all levels and we have to consider the particular situation of such areas where the solution need to take into social and I am very pleased to hear the cultural differences of course and of course economic particularities because it is also very important. And I also agree with, uh, with Horgos' observation that instead of suppressing citizens' manifestations Manifestation against local project, we should rather find ways in involving citizens in such projects, which I believe it is, it is very, very important. And of course, we should have a remark on exercising democracy. And of course, uh, uh, it is very important to talk about on direct democracy, especially at local level, because you have to start on local level that democracy. And of course, the way direct democracy should be exercised is not self-evident. It is also not a question whether to foster democracy, but how to do it. And of course, we have to give the right tool uh, for citizens. Uh, by way of example, let us consider local referenda. They should never be formulated as a simplistic yes or no question. It is much more diverse. It, you just have to go uh, into details as well. And of course, I also believe in, in the so-called constructive dialogue, which, which is really necessary. And of course, providing the local community with the power of the choice has the potential of avoiding usually automatic resistance or even uh, changing opposition, the support through, uh, through that type of uh, constructing uh, dialogue. And of course, you also have to mention how multi-level governance may be effectively practiced uh, without obstructing the very much needed bottom-up participatory processes. And of course, the uniqueness of the EU does not rely on the large-scale European-wide projects, so I think it is also very important. And what we should keep in mind that the EU is first and foremost about multi-level governance, so that's what uh, I believe it is important. So just to sum up, uh, smart, smart multi-level governance not only allows for meaningful level of community input and involvement, but also skillfully inspire it. And of course, that is also very important to have the right uh, inspiration. And uh, I just would, uh, I could make some more comments concerning style, uh, concerning communication, concerning the language, concerning the body language, which is also very, very important. Uh, and of course, uh, it is very important to be representative, as, uh, as I already uh, told you. So I believe that uh, you have to have a practical involvement, you need the proper goal, you need a creative concept. I think we heard so many excellent examples uh, with our uh, excellent speaker. So let's make it clear that if you would like to keep your society alive, then it is very important to, to, to take citizens on the board. And now it's high time to understand that 
Europe goes quite extreme, and we don't need that type of extremism. We, we, give, we have to give back the hope for European citizens. So let's make this project together. I believe it's a common project for the left and the right to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Zita Gourmai. Thank you to all our uh, panelists uh, for that uh, discussion on uh, citizen uh, participation. Uh, we had some uh, uh, different uh, points of view and different examples from around uh, the continent. Thank you. Uh, it was a very interesting debate. I'm sorry they were so short and I had to make everybody stay to time, but some people have to leave uh, this evening on planes and so forth. If you're not leaving, um, there is the inauguration of the beautiful, green, smart and inclusive, colourful cities exhibition in the foyer of the Tivoli Centre here. If you want to uh, uh, stay uh, for that, uh, that will happen uh, in a few moments. Uh, so please uh, feel free to stay for that. And otherwise, thank you very much. And uh, I hope the, uh, the, the, the discussions are as interesting tomorrow. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>